it might have just been an exhibition win for Carolina basketball on Friday night. And you might be thinking, hey, I need to temper my excitement, not get too overboard. But there's no reason to temper. Go overboard. Year three of Hubert Davis is about to be something different. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Monday, October 30th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for joining us to get your Tar Heels content every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Y'all, one week from today is the tip off of the regular season Carolina hosting Radford in college basketball. I cannot believe it's here, but it is. If you'd like to be part of getting ready for that and talking about it, Come join our Discord, our Locked On Tar Heels Discord, where we're having conversations all the time. The link is in the show notes, whether you're listening or watching to the show. Check it out. Coming up on the show today, we're going to try to figure out, uh, you know, what's wrong with Carolina football? What is happening right now? It's hard to believe after such a great start. It's been a two-game losing streak. We'll talk about that later. But before we get to that, we're going to spend some time talking about Carolina basketball and this exhibition game from Friday night. Speaking of which, coming up this week, we got a couple of phenomenal interviews surrounding Carolina basketball that you are not going to want to miss. I'm just telling you that right now. Here, here's the thing. On Friday's show, I discussed um, that in the exhibition game, we would learn a ton about the basketball game, about the basketball team, excuse me, from Friday night's game. Not because it was a great opponent. In fact, precisely because it wasn't. A great opponent. Here's what I mean. Elite level teams know who they are and are so dialed in that it doesn't matter whether it's another blue blood program or a D2 or whatever that you're playing an exhibition game against. It doesn't matter. They are going to play at the same level of intensity, at the same level of execution, at the same level of being dialed in on every single little thing they need to be dialed in on that. That is what elite teams do. That's what I was looking for from Carolina, but that's not what happened on Friday night. They actually were more dialed in than I expected them to be legitimately. Like I was like, okay, we'll see. We'll see how ready it is. We'll see how cohesive it is. It was much more than I anticipated. They were more locked in. They had the look of a team with a mission, a mission that everyone was bought into and a mission that everyone wanted to play their role as part of. This was a look of a team that has goals that they will not be dissuaded from no matter who they are playing. And that, to me, started with R.J. Davis. A minute and 42 seconds into this game, the score was R.J. Davis 8, St. Augs 0. He scored 17 points in the first 5 minutes and 43 seconds. In fact, St. Augs as a team didn't take a lead over R.J. Davis by himself until they hit a three with four minutes and 42 seconds to go in the first half. And that made it St. Augs 23, R.J. Davis 20. That's how locked in this dude was out of the gate. He finished 22 points, eight of 14 from the field, five of 10 from three, one of one from the free throw line, had a rebound, three assists, zero turnovers, and two steals. Now, obviously, those numbers would have been bigger if Carolina needed him more, but that, that's what it was. And the key to all that, it was within the flow of the game. It was within the flow of the offense. RJ just took what was there. Nothing forced, nothing panicky, just RJ being RJ. And let me remind you, he missed last year's exhibition because of as he was dealing with that index finger weird thing. Now, this is this is it. This is what you're getting from RJ this year. And from what I've been told. From the exhibition or the the secret scrimmage against FAU, it was like this, but more so because they needed him more. This is what you're getting from R.J. Davis. Now, here's why I have such faith that what happened on Friday wasn't just, oh, here's a much more talented team coasting past an overmatched opponent in an exhibition game. 
because much of what happened on Friday night was translatable beyond this exhibition game, regardless of opponent. Let me give you four examples. Number one, and the biggest one, is ball movement. You've heard me talk about this ad nauseum, how Carolina, uh, honestly, the past two years, has not moved the ball, but particularly last year, at the rate that you expect from a Carolina team. As a team last season, they were under 50% on assist percentage. But in this game, they had 23 assists on 43 made baskets, 53.5% assist rate. I, I expect Carolina to be in this range the majority of the season. And, and obviously, the, the pure assist numbers is part of ball movement, but it's not the entire story. As you watched the game Friday, what did you see? The ball was moving around. It was not sticking Sometimes uh, in, in from Coach Davis's comments post game, almost too much. He said, "I want us to go from a good shot to a great shot because of passing." Sometimes we were going good, great, great, not as good, right? And so th there is a level of like, don't be too unselfish, and and that's going to be part of the process is finding out what those shots are. But there is such good encouragement from this ball movement and not sticking. And beyond those twenty three assists, there were so many other assists that were not basketball assists that would have been hockey assists though where it was like oh that pass that led to the thing multiple examples of that beyond all this there was also healthy distribution right you expect a lot of it to come from rj and elliot but it wasn't just those dudes there was assist numbers across the board five different players had three or more assists every starter had at least two assists. And remember, that didn't even include Elliot Cadeau, who didn't start in this game. Nine different Tar Heels had at least one assist in this game. This team is moving the ball. Number two thing that I think is translatable. Carolina had 25 fast break points in this game. By the way, compared to zero, none, nada, zilch for St. Augs. Carolina, 25 fast break points. Now, the, this might have a... You know, there's some, the opponent baked into this one, but the fact that Carolina is actually getting out and doing it, the way they went about it is what's translatable. You saw it pitch ahead. You saw it dribble ahead. You saw that happen from multiple players, not just RJ, not just Elliot. Harrison Ingram's able to get out and go. Cormac's able to get out and go. Um, uh, Pax and Wojcik. Any of these dudes are able to do it, and it is going to be something that Carolina is going to hammer home all season long. Number three. Uh, reason that what I saw on Friday night is translatable. There is depth and it is real and Hubert Davis will have to use it in year three. And I legitimately believe that he will this year. You saw it in scoring. Yes, it was RJ leading the scoring charge with 22. Absolutely. But it was all spread around because Carolina scored 117 points in this game. And not a single Tar Heel had more than RJ's 100, 100, more than RJ's 22 points. Seven different Tar Heels scored in double digits. That is depth. That is real and re uh, repeatable. Second, double doubles. There were almost three double doubles in this game. Armando had 13 and 10. Zayden High had 10 and 11. And Harrison Ingram had 16 and 9. And again, you got to think that if you needed more from Harrison Ingram, you would have got it. Almost three double. The, the fact that Armando was getting that kind of help on the glass from Harrison Ingram, that he's getting that kind of glass help from Zayden High, you got to have that and you love to see it. Another reason the depth is real is that the halftime score, uh, Carolina was up, was it 65 25? I feel like that's off by a point. I feel like I wrote that down right. 65 26. I had that wrong by one point. Um, was the halftime score. But here's why I bring that up in terms of talking about depth. Carolina had 65 halftime points. Armando had just six of those. If Carolina is going to do that in a preseason AP All-American only has six of them, <laughs> yeah, that's why the depth is so, so real. Good luck to everyone else if Carolina is doing that without Mondo doing much. And I, I just kept finding myself all weekend as I was thinking back through the game. Things like, man, that was wild. And, but, oh, yeah, we haven't even talked about this uh, co contribution or that guy or this dude that do this. Harrison Ingram is a great example of that. Everything that he brought to this game, like you talk about 
Elliott and Mondo and RJ. And then you look at Harrison Ingram and it's like, oh, he had 16 points on six of 11 shooting, two of four from three, two of two from the free throw line, nine rebounds, three assists, zero turnovers and three blocks. And that's an afterthought. The depth is very, very real. And then the fourth reason that what I believe happened on Friday night is translatable to the season. And this actually might be the biggest one. I said it was a system. It might be this, is that this is a team that is locked into one another and together. I, I don't know that I've ever seen RJ Davis happier in his four years at Carolina. He was jovial. He was joking around with his teammates. Uh, the Harrison Ingram brings it out of him. And I, I love to see it in the same way that Cormac and Paxson are these like fierce competitors that hold everybody accountable. Harrison Ingram is this jovial dude that brings everyone else up. Uh, another example of this, this is a team, is Elliot Cadeau and just how excited, crazily excited he gets for his teammates. So a great example of this. Uh, Zayden High had this great chase down block, which he um, deflected off the backboard, went straight to Harrison Ingram, who pitched ahead to RJ Davis. Harrison kept running. RJ, a little uh, drop off bounce pass for Harrison, uh, dunk in transition. I mean, it was so quick, your head was spinning. But right there on the other side of the play, on the other block, is Elliot Cadeau. As Ingram went up for the dunk, Elliot jumped with him and then was just bouncing around like a little puppy dog, so happy for the play and so happy for his teammates in a play that he wasn't even directly involved in. That's what a team is, and that's part of why this is translatable. These And these guys play for each other, and they play hard, like Pax and Wojcik diving on the floor in a game that doesn't even really matter. What Carolina did on Friday night gives reason to be excited because it's translatable and Carolina can do this over and over. Well, I want to talk a, about some more of the intangibles and other random things that happened from this exhibition football game or football basketball game on Friday night. Some very exciting things. The freshmen chipping in in big ways and maybe some of it not even expected. We'll talk about it in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by athletic brewing now it's time for your game changer of the week brought to you by athletic brewing company much like we already talked about it rj davis went off on friday night athletic brewing has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game they make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good full flavor well crafted just like a full strength beer I mean, this dude was on an absolute tear Friday night. We already said it, but he outscored St. Augs by himself, eight to nothing in the first 102 seconds of the game. You can find Athletic Brewing Company's non-alcoholic brews at a store near you or buy online at athleticbrewing.com. First time customers can use code locked on to get 15% off your first online order. That's code locked on at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewing.com. Near beer, exclusions and conditions apply. Athletic Brewing Company fit for all times. This episode is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience. What brings home that winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. From any of that, whatever it is that you're into, speed, power, style, eBay Motors has got you covered because they got it all. They've got 122 million parts, more than that, for your number one ride or die. And with that, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. All right, let me give you some other takeaways from the basketball game on Friday night. Things that I thought were very important or notable or things that stood out. We we talked on Friday about Coach Davis's four offensive and defensive principles that we're going to be looking at all season long because this is what he has challenged the team with. I want to point out some of those, some of them we've already done. Like, for example, the first of the offensive principles, number one, be a running team. We talked about it, but 25 fast break points to none for St. Augs. Number two, Attack and dominate the offensive glass. Carolina had 19 offensive rebounds, which translated into 26 second chance 
points. I haven't gone through and done all my percentages and stuff like that like we do for the regular season, but they were getting to the offensive glass. We're going to have to see how that one translates when you're playing a team with more size and um, and uh, be just better talent. Number three, unselfish with passes and screens. Carolina was doing that, as we already said, almost too much at times. And dominate points in the paint is number four offensive principle coaches watching for. Yeah, the Tar Heels led that one 52 to 14. Again, that one to me does have more to do with opponent and is less translatable. But the fact that Carolina is getting into the paint, whether through the dribble or post play, is great news. <clears throat> On the defensive side, number one, be great at guarding the ball. Carolina held St. Augs to 26.6% field goal percentage for the game. I think that is some of both. That is the opponent, but it's also Carolina being dialed in. And then the others, box out, top team in defensive rebounding percentage. Carolina did a great job on the defensive glass, but again, that is opponent specific, I believe. And then talk, trust, and good communication. That, that you have to do no matter who you're playing, and I thought Carolina did that well. And then fourthly, protect the paint is the fourth defensive principle. 14 points in the paint was it for St. Augs. That, to me, along with Carolina's eight blocks, is <clears throat> opponent dependent. But it's great to see Carolina having multiple guys get blocks. You know, we talked about Zayden High having three. We talked about Harrison Ingram having three. The fact that it's not just Mondo, uh, and you expect some of that out of James Aconquo. Uh, you expect that out of Jalen Withers when he's in and playing. So that's great. Let's talk about the freshmen some. There are two freshmen on this team, if you're not aware. That's Elliot Cadeau and Zayden High. Cadeau is the one that we already expect to come in and make a big contribution in year one. And he did on Friday night. I mean, when you start to see the things that he's able to bring to this team, I mean, it, it's multiple and it's great. For example, he's got the athleticism to, like this dunk that he had was silly. Turned down a screen to his left, went right, just blew by his depend, uh, defender. Um, the post help from St. Augs, he made a business decision, just sl sl slid out of the way, and Elliot just yammed all over, man, and it was phenomenal. But then you've got other things, like there was a play where uh, he had a pick, went to the right wing, RJ fades to the left corner, and Elliot finds RJ over the top for a three. It was a thing of beauty, and I, I tweeted about it. I was like, this is something... That again, this is not about anything with RJ and Caleb. It's just that RJ has never played with a true point guard before. And now he is, and it's going to unlock so much more from him. And that was a great example of it. Or that pitch ahead that he had to Jalen Washington in transition. I mean, it was like a beautiful touch pass um, on a go route from a quarterback. Just laying it over the top into the receiver's arms. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um there, there was another where uh, this was in the first half. Um, Elliot turned the corner, got downhill in a hurt. Like as he's starting to learn uh, shifting gears with his speed, boy, uh, drew multiple defenders as he got into the lane, dumped it off to Jay Wash, uh, who went up. Uh, I think it was an alley actually to Jay Wash, but he got fouled and went to the free throw line. First half alone for Elliot, five points, two rebounds, four assists. I mean, great stuff. But what was perhaps even more impressive to me, because it's less expected, is Zayden High's contributions. Not only Friday night, but last Friday night in live action. It's back-to-back -back consistent performances now from Zayden High, who is providing stat-stuffing capability across the board. And he is doing things that are going to force the coaching staff to play him. If he keeps contributing across the board at a high level, doing the things that, as it's been told to me that he has been asked to do and he's doing those at a high level. There might be no one that I've ever had one projection of preseason that he might Im impact the, the season during the regular season more than anything I anticipated. Like last season, that was DeMarco Dunn, where like Coach Pat Kilby and I both didn't have much expectations, and he did more than we expected, but, you know, incrementally so. If Zayden is able to continue doing what he's done these first two games, he's going to blow away my preseason expectations of his contribution to this team. Um, first half alone, two points, eight boards, an assist, and three blocks, finished 
with 10 points, 11 boards, four of six from the floor, two of two from the free throw line, an assist in three blocks. That's phenomenal. I also love he had a couple chase down blocks that he didn't block them out of bounds, blocked them off the backboard so that hopefully they would rebound the other way and Carolina can get him. I don't need somebody that can just block shots. I need somebody that can block shots to their teammates because it's not just about blocking it. It's about gaining possession. That's the goal. And so the big question for me is Jalen Withers hasn't played uh, or didn't play Friday night. And so when he's back and available, what will that mean for some of these minutes that, that Zayden had? We'll have to watch that and see. Hopefully, they will all get these minutes, and it's more, more, more depth. That's only going to benefit the team. But notable on Friday night, the first two players to check in were these two freshmen at the same time. All right, just a couple other things for us here. Three, and then we'll move on to football. Number one, injuries. Just talked about Jalen Withers. We just know upper body injury. Not much definition on it right now. Hopefully, we'll find out more. Uh, Seth Trimble has not played either in live action or last this Friday in the exhibition. Um, Coach Davis said in his presser after the game, quote, he twisted it early in the preseason ankle, and then he twisted again, nothing more than that. So just waiting on this ankle to heal. Same thing. If you watch the game, you know that towards the end of the first half, Cormac Ryan went down with an injury, went straight back to the locker room. That wasn't because of severity. That was because of proximity to halftime. No point in him going to the bench there. Just went straight to the locker room. But the good news is after the game, Coach Davis said, quote, just a little tweak. He could have gone back in to the game. I decided not to play him in the second half, end quote. Just no reason, right? Why would you need to do that? <clears throat> Another thing that really stood out to me in this game was Carolina's defense. Now, I know Pat Kilby and I were texting some about it over the weekend. He's going to have some stuff to say about it on Wednesday's show. But the thing that really stood out most to me is Carolina was switching one through four out on the perimeter, meaning all like, you know, the positions are one through five point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward is one through four. Carolina switched all four of those. That's the benefit of playing Harrison Ingram at the four as opposed to a two big lineup. So, Mondo's in the paint, but everything else, Carolina is just switching it. That is a new defensive wrinkle. And one I'm curious to see, was that just for this exhibition game or is that going to be a defensive staple this year? Uh, so uh, I don't want to spoil any of the rest of it. I'll let Coach Pat Kilby talk with you about that on Wednesday. Last thing I want to point out, and the fact that we haven't gotten to this yet is crazy, but here we go. Three-point shooting. Carolina last year had the second lowest three-point percentage in program history as a team. In this game, they shot 10 of 18 in the first half, 55.6%. For the game, Carolina shot 45.7%, 16 of 35. Here's the thing. Is Carolina going to shoot like that from three every game? It'd be awesome. No. But... Are they clearly, clearly a better three-point shooting team than they were last year because of what they've brought in in the transfer portal and other guys doing it? Undoubtedly so. Again, no disrespect to Caleb Love, but he had Carolina's most three-point attempts and was under 30% as a shooter from three last year. Those, those attempts have to go somewhere, and guys who are more efficient three-point shooters, that's going to translate in a really good way. And, and again, RJ, uh, hopefully being healthy with his shooting hand is going to help with that too. Cormac Ryan, his shot is so quick. Get in and off quick. Harrison Ingram knocked down a couple. Jalen Washington hit a couple. Remember, he didn't have any last season. Um, obviously, Creighton Lebo is not going to get to do that consistently in a game, but it was cool to see him knock down a couple as well. So Carolina, again, it's just an exhibition game, but you cannot help but be overjoyed with what you saw on Friday. We're going to wait to see how it translates to the regular season next Monday. Now, as high as everyone was on Friday night following the basketball exhibition, everyone was that low on Saturday following Carolina's second straight loss in football. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by Prize Picks. Testing my skills on Prize Picks in all sorts of sports is honestly one of my favorite ways to play daily fantasy sports. If you got the skills, you can turn 10 bucks into 250 with just a couple taps. 
Price Picks is a really simple way to do fantasy sports for busy people like me. I love it because I can make my picks and submit my entry in less than 60 seconds. Seriously, this thing is crazy easy. Here's how it works. You pick two or more players and choose more or less than the given stat projection, and then you just watch the winnings roll in. How about this? Jameer Gibbs on Monday Night Football. As I record this on Sunday, I'm losing 135 to 96 in my fantasy football matchup, and I need Jameer Gibbs to go crazy. So why not pick him in prize picks as well? His rush yards is set at 68.5. I need him to hit them more on that, so smash that for sure. Go to prizepicks.com slash college and use code LockedOnCollege for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash college and use code LockedOnCollege for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. For the third straight season, Georgia Tech has defeated a ranked North Carolina football team. And not only three in a row, but Georgia Tech has now beat Carolina five out of the last six times they've played in this series and 11 of the last 13 times they've played in Atlanta. The Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets are a thorn in North Carolina's side. Not, not a stinger, a thorn. <laughs> I, honestly, y'all, I'm dumbfounded. After the start to the season and then the last two weeks being what they've been, and, and I don't know how the team overcomes this in terms of like achieving their goals. There's disappointment after the Virginia, but maybe it's just like a one-off weird thing. Any hope of this making the CFP was essentially gone, but there was still the hope of making the ACC championship game. But now, after a second straight loss to an inferior team, quite frankly, that hope is gone too. How do you recover? And what do you play for? Do you play for pride? Do you play for being able to say that despite losing to Virginia and Georgia Tech, you knocked off Duke, Clemson, and NC State? I mean, that would be phenomenal. But is that is that going to be enough to motivate the team to keep going? What What is going to be that motivator? This is This is a look in the mirror and figure out who you are and what this team is type of moment. This whole thing was odd on Saturday night. This game started off exactly how you wanted it to. Carolina didn't force a three and out on Georgia Tech's opening possession. They had one first down and then a punt. Carolina scores with Omarion Hampton running wacky. And you're like, I think I said something like, Omarion's about to run for 300 tonight, and this is going to be a blowout. Because then on Georgia Tech's next possession, turnover on downs. Carolina goes and scores again, 14-0. Then another turnover on downs for Georgia Tech. Carolina is driving. They complete a third and forever. That's called back for a hold on Diego Pounds. We'll talk more about that in a second. And no, no certainty that Carolina scores there, but assuming they do, it's 21 nothing, and you're starting to really think blowout. Instead, Carolina has to punt. Georgia Tech goes and scores, and now it's 14-7, to and it's a different story. And that's into the second quarter. This is also odd because in the third quarter, that went as desired. Carolina led the third quarter seven to nothing. In fact, they held the ball for 13 minutes and 16 seconds, limiting Georgia Tech to having the ball for just a minute 44. So you're like, the defense is refreshed. We're ready to go. What a phenomenal first and third quarter. Unfortunately, here's the problem. In a weird turn of events, On Saturday night, they actually decided to play the second and fourth quarters in this game as well. What do you know about that? Here's the problem. Had this game just been played the first and third quarters, it would have been 21 to nothing Carolina. But since they actually decided to play those other 30 minutes, Georgia Tech in those two quarters racked up 46 points and 537 yards of total offense. What? How on earth does that happen, particularly in the fourth quarter as you're coming off not even hardly playing any defensive snaps and the defense looked like it was just done and gone? I I cannot explain it to you. But let's go back to that Diego Pounds thing for a moment. I, I never want to be one who is guilty of blaming losses on officials. So that's not what I'm going to do because this is just one play in a game that Carolina had a lot more time that they had to win the game. But 
This hold that was called on Diego Pounds, I'm sorry that he's bigger than the guy, but it's just like, that's not a hold unless there was something with his right arm that I just couldn't see because of the camera angle. So again, instead of being up potentially 21 to nothing, it's 14 to seven. And this is two weeks in a row that Carolina has had this exact kind of thing happen to them in something that like the one against Virginia was more game changing to me because it literally erased a touchdown that could have been the difference in that game. But again, it doesn't matter because you go through the rest of this game and, and the defense, something happened in those two quarters <laughs> where it, I, I don't know, you know, if it's the season catching up with them. Cause again, in the fourth quarter, it couldn't, they had basically taken the third quarter off. I, I, Georgia tech found a wrinkle. Everything fell apart all at once. Now let's talk about Tez Walker because football matters, but life matters more. Uh, he got lit up late in the game. And let me say something about the football side of that before we get to the personal side of that. From a football perspective, it was really tough. Tez got lit up, fumbled, Georgia Tech recovered. It stinks because it would have been a first down at the Tech 24 and still a minute 30-ish for Carolina to go score a game-winning touchdown. But again, same, same with that hold on Diego Pounds. Carolina should not have been in that position where they had to have that to win the game. From the human perspective, which matters, again, infinitely more, Tez was released from the hospital on Sunday. Uh, ESPN's Andrea Adelson tweeted, quote, Tez Walker has been released from the hospital per UNC. And then she quoted, Tez is doing better. He has been released from the hospital and is flying back to Chapel Hill this morning, meaning, meaning Sunday morning, end quote. So uh, we wait to see on availability, you know, what, what's going on, the severity of it. Hopefully we will learn that today, Monday in Coach um brown's press conference and so man that that was a tough moment yet you, you hate to see everything he's gone through and then that happened moving forward there's not much else to say like there's just not much point in getting into the the minutia of this game all that much because there are bigger things at work here carolina has got to go out and and do this they cannot waste drake may's last year like this well this is a get get right week coming up against Campbell. Hopefully you can get this defense some rest, hopefully fewer reps from the dudes um, so that they can be ready for this closing stretch, which again is Duke, NC State, uh, Duke Clemson and NC State, I guess I should say. Now, again, your postseason goals kind of shot at this point, but boy, you feel a lot different if you could end the season by salvaging something in those three games of if you could go knock off Duke Clemson NC State that does leave a much better taste in your mouth and gives you a better bowl game so that to me is the motivation going forward get right against Campbell and then let's let's run off those final three in a row all right folks uh happy beginning to the show sad end to the show. Um, lots of other Carolina action going on this weekend. I'm so sorry we're late on time, so I'm not going to run us through the weekend whip around, um, but you can go find that on Tar Heels, and, and we'll talk about it later in the week as we get ready for next weekend. It's great to be back together to start the week. I want to remind you, it's going to be a phenomenal week, the lead up to the college basketball season. Lots of great stuff coming at you. Can't wait to share it with you. Ah, you can email the show, LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. Come join the Discord, where, again, we're having conversation all the time. The link is in the show notes, either audio or video. Subscribe to the show wherever you're watching or listening. Smash the like button, and we'd love to hear your comments on the basketball or football games. Always, it's a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll be right back with you tomorrow. But until then, peace. Peace.